Hello, you're listening to An Israeli Now Monitor, and I'm Ben Kaspit from Tel Aviv. What we call the Israeli peace camp once uh, compromised the vast majority of the Israeli public. It had a governing party, Labour, and nearly 50 seats in the Knesset. Fast forward a decade or two, an intifada or two, and nowadays the Israeli left has five to ten seats in the Knesset, and that's on a good day. Peace Now, the protest movement that uh, could once mobilize tens of thousands, has shrunk. We don't have uh, time to analyze the historical, political, and social reasons for the decline of the Israeli left, and to discuss how much of what happened was uh, the fault of the camp itself, or of its uh, sometimes present, sometimes absent Palestinian partner, or of deep demographic shifts uh, in Israel. Still, while the left is weaker, it hasn't disappeared. It's down, not out. The left-wing uh, movement breaking the silence continues to spread the protest of uh, Israeli soldiers and officers against what they term the indefensible actions of an occupying army. The area they uh, call the West Bank is known to most Israelis by the biblical name, Judea and Samaria. And what the movement sees as occupation, many Israelis regard as the realization of a historic right and or a strategic necessity. Peace Now is also still active. In recent weeks, it made headlines with its plans to rent a bulldozer and drive it up to an illegal outpost built by settlers on the grounds of Homesh, a settlement that was evacuated as part of Israel's disengagement from Gaza, where settlers have since uh, operated a yeshiva. Despite court rulings, the settlers have uh, refused to leave. Last December, a Homesh yeshiva student was murdered by Palestinian extremists, and the outpost is now a symbol of settler deter determination. Our guest today is Hagit Ofran, a veteran, determined Peace Now activist responsible for the organization's settlement mapping project. She's also the granddaughter of uh, one of the most influential and controversial Israelis over to live here, Professor Isaiah Leibovich. Our conversation is taking place on the day of the flag parade which is an annual event organized by your religious Zionism to celebrate what they see as the liberation of Jerusalem from Arab control. Last year's celebration set off a war with Hamas in Gaza and bloody riots in mixed Jewish Arab cities. Right now, this parade is over peacefully, thank God. Hagit Ofran and I will be waiting for you after this short break. I'm Elizabeth Hagedorn, and I'm the State Department correspondent at El Monitor. And I'm Joe Snell. I'm El Monitor's video editor. Let's admit it. This past year has been difficult to stay on top of the news and sift through what's accurate and what's misleading. Let El Monitor help you. If you care about the Middle East and North Africa, you should consider listening to El Monitor's audio series on the Middle East with Andrew Parasoliti and Amber and Zaman, and on Israel with Ben Caspi. You can now watch our newest video podcast, Reading the Middle East with Gilles Capel. You can subscribe to these series on your favorite podcast platforms. And through a host of free daily and weekly newsletters, we offer a range of perspectives with the highest journalistic standards. You can subscribe to these newsletters at almonitor.com. As an award-winning media service headquartered in Washington, D.C., Almonitor has a network of over 160 contributors around the world. So if you haven't done so already, be sure to visit almonitor.com, where you can find all of these newsletters and podcasts, along with first-class reporting and analysis. Now it's time to welcome and say shalom uh, to Hagit Ofran. Hi, Hagit, and thank you for joining us here in, uh, on Israel and Al Monitor. Shalom, Hagit. Shalom, hi, Ben. Let's uh, uh, dive straight into the, the celebration. We are celebrating today in Israel the Jerusalem Day. But I, I, I'll first talk uh, with you about Chomesh. There is no doubt that the outpost uh, violates the disengagement law. 
and that your uh, demand uh, in, in peace now to evacuate it, uh, it is uh, legal. But since when has peace now used such aggressive tactics as moving in with a bulldozer? It looks like a provocation just waiting for the police to intervene and block the protest which he did uh, finally. Is the, the, the using the D9, the bulldozer, was the right thing to your movement as Peace Now? Look, I, I think uh, if we didn't bring the bulldozer, um, maybe you wouldn't uh, hear about it. And um, we will, would have uh, protest, we would bring hundreds of people and nobody would uh, talk about it. Uh, so that's one thing. But I think more important is that we want to change a little bit the language because what the settlers are doing is a total violation of, of the laws and you know uh, putting um, putting all all the the Israeli all the Israelis Israeli government as uh, holding them as a hostage. Um, they decide where to go, what land to take, what will be the security uh, considerations of Israel, and they are allowed to do whatever they want. So we wanted to say, this is insane. This is impossible. We cannot just say, oh, it's not nice. We want you to, to change things. We, we want to say as if it's okay for them to establish it, so it's okay for us to take it down. Understood. And uh, do you believe that finally uh, Minister of Defense Benny Gantz will evacuate Chomesh because the political situation right now in Israel uh, uh, makes uh, creates a, a bizarre situation that if uh, the government will uh, will evacuate Chomesh, by the way, I think that the Netanyahu government did dozens of times, but the settlers, uh, we have to, to say it, the settlers are coming back all the time. But if uh, the Bennett Lapid government will evacuate Chomesh, it will maybe fall down, and then you will get the extreme right again. So maybe it's, it, it's a lose lose situation from your side. Uh, I think all the time people say, oh, but the government will fall, but the government will fall. Well, the government is uh, in a shaky situation from the beginning. But it didn't fall until now, and there are enough interests to keep it uh, um, on, and therefore it continues. And uh, we cannot um, uh, paralyze everything by saying, "Oh, it will fall, it will fall." Uh, it's a, it's about time that the owners of the land uh, will be allowed to return to their land without being hit and attacked by uh, settlers. And it's about time that the Israeli IDF, the Israeli army, will not need to protect the group of, of uh, um, settlers who are violating the law and uh, settling in a dangerous place. Okay, I want to ask you a more general question before we will go on with the Jerusalem Day and Temple Mount and the, the parade of flags, etc. You are considered a leading expert on the settlement uh, enterprise, at least on your side of the political map. Can you say how many Israelis live in those settlements nowadays? Are the numbers growing or shrinking? I've been seeing different figures. Everyone says different things. It's a fact that there is a, there are a lot more settlers today than it, there, there, there's been a, a 10 or 20 years ago. But in the last few years, what's the situation from your eyes? Um, I look at the data, or the official data of the government of Israel, which is the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics, and the numbers uh, are clear that there is a constant growth in the settlements. We are talking about almost half a million living in West Bank settlements and another 220 or actually 30,000 in East Jerusalem. These are the numbers. What we, we did see is a little slowdown in the growth, meaning that if it was 10 years ago, uh, four or three and a half percent growth a year, which is huge uh, comparing to Israel, which is less than 2%, uh, 
Now the growth in settlement is two and a half or a little more. So there is a slowdown in the uh, growth uh, rate, but uh, there is growth all the time. No shrinkage. Uh, no, there are some settlements that you have more people that left them than people moved in, but but uh, in general, it's growing. The total numbers are growing. You yeah. know, when the Oslo agreements were signed in 1993, some 40,000 settlers were living in Judea and Samaria, almost 30 years on, that number is said to be between half a million and 600,000, as just uh, you stated right, right now. Israel's uh, recognition uh, at the time of a two-state solution was supposed to mark the end of the settlement enterprise, or at least to seriously shrink it. But in fact, the possible, uh, the opposite is uh, is true. Would it be correct to say uh, the settlers have won, or does it look differently from your uh, perspective? Of course, they won in the short term, um, meaning that they are there, they're growing. And in the uh, general uh, public opinion, most of the Israelis and the Palestinians and the international community uh, don't see any way out or any way for Israel to withdraw from the West Bank because we have so many settlers there. However, they did not succeed in persuading the Israeli public that settlements are so important that we cannot give it up forever. What they managed to do is to use the sentiment of the fear and the security saying we cannot withdraw, and we cannot uh, trust the Palestinians, what will happen if we leave. But as soon as there is leadership in Israel that says, that's it, we are going uh, out of the West Bank, the majority of Israelis, I'm sure, will support it. And, you know, I, I like to say that the, the bad news is that uh, in Israel, nobody cares about what's going on in the West, West Bank. But at the same time, the good news is that nobody cares about the settlements or what's going on in the West Bank. And most Israelis never visited the settlement and they couldn't care less if some settlers would have to move to another place. So I'm, uh, I cannot say I'm optimistic right now, but I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm sure that it is possible to uh, bring Israel to withdraw. Uh, we just don't see the political way to get there right now. It's interesting to hear it from you because as my impression is that the Israeli public uh, moved a, a long way to the right and that the two-state solution is losing ground rapidly. By, by the way, on the other side as well. And there is no leadership to talk about it. Do you see an Israeli leader that will be popular enough? He has to come from the center or the center right because no lefty Israeli leader after Rabin's assassination will, will get enough, enough support to do it. Do you really see the possibility of what you just said of a, a, a bold leadership that will tell Israelis it's about time to establish the, the Palestinian state that will live side by side and etc. cetera? Um, do I see the leader? No, I don't see her yet, but um, it doesn't mean that it's impossible, okay? Truly, politically, right now, it's not feasible to have a two-state solution, but Sometime, and we never know what will happen. You know, we didn't know if you came uh, uh, to Russia in uh, 1988, you wouldn't know that uh, it will collapse a few months later. And uh, maybe, maybe um, this um, can happen to the Israeli control over the West Bank. Okay, uh, now uh, you're, of course, from Peace Now, and uh, this movement has, uh, have, has been harshly critical of the annual flag parade, which goes through the Muslim quarter of uh, Muslim quarter of Jerusalem's old city, something you regard as a deliberate provocation and a slap in the face of the Muslim uh, residents. We are now in the middle of this uh, parade. 
and we all hope it will uh, end uh, peacefully. Last year, by the way, uh, this parade exactly was uh, shut down by Prime Minister De Netanyahu, and then we we had this clash with Gaza and the, the clash in the in the uh, cities here in Israel, and uh, many people lost their lives, etc. Uh, on the other hand, the right wing claims uh, your objections demonstrate disloyalty to the concept of a, a unified Jerusalem. They basically argue that Israelis have their, the right to display their flag anywhere. Uh, what's your argument? It's not a flag parade, it's a hate parade. And what we see year and year again is horrible uh, pictures of uh, Israeli youngsters screaming and yelling hate songs and racist uh, chanting and even already today we saw some hitting and some uh, cursing and harassment against the palestinians uh, it is um, not nothing to be proud of and by the way this jerusalem day is not really celebrated by the israeli public it is very narrow uh, group or distinct group of people the national religious movement that made it into a big um, holiday, but the majority of Israelis don't even remember that this day exists unless there is a mega provocation, like uh, right now in the parade in the old city. Um, and uh, I think that it is uh, really a, a shame that the government of Israel is allowing this uh, to take place and um, they can celebrate Jerusalem not by going through the old city and the Muslim quarter. Jerusalem is not only the old city, Jerusalem not, is not only the Muslim quarter, it's also the Jewish quarter, it's also West Jerusalem. There are many places to celebrate Jerusalem. Uh uh, it, the Jerusalem Day is not the only the the parade of uh, parade of flags. We also have the so sensitive and explosive issue of the Temple Mount. After the the uh, when Israel uh, uh, conquered uh, East Jerusalem in a six day war and they unified the city and declared it as the eternal uh, capital. There was a status quo. Uh, the, the Muslims kept on uh, praying in their mosque uh, on Temple Mount, and we came back to the Western Wall. It is down uh, downstairs uh, from there, and uh, we let a few Israeli pilgrims to go to the Temple Mount, but not pray, and not provoc provocate or uh, or uh, sing the, the anthem or wave an Israeli flag. Today, we had a record the number of Israelis going up to the Temple Mount. Some uh, had uh, uh, blue and white flags. Some uh, tried to pray. How do you see this uh, move uh, in the status quo? Do you fear it, it will bring us uh, to, to, to a bad place? I think already it brought us to very bad place, places. The instability, the violence of recent years is not coming from nowhere. And the uh, Temple Mount, the Haram Sharif, is the volcanic core of our conflict. And we're let, letting the, the pyromaniacs uh, to play with the matches. And we are allowing them to, by, by claiming that it's a, an issue of freedom of worship, which is a total bluff, um, to, to say, well, it's legitimate that the Jews will be allowed to, to pray on the Temple Mount while what they are really doing is um, provocation and demonstrations of sovereignty over the Temple Mount. And today, I think we saw the most extreme uh, pictures that we, I haven't saw, seen uh, in the past. Uh, hundreds of, of Israelis chanting out loud on the Temple Mount uh, in a demonstration, which I believe to be uh, opposite to the holiness. And you know, uh, if it is so holy for us, we cannot make it like a, a, a soccer field um, chanting place. 
and uh, it's proving to be not about the freedom of worship but about the the freedom to to uh, to to show sovereignty and to provoke uh, the muslim presence and the muslim holiness and i want to also to add that as a jew that do care about the temple mount our heritage was never about uh, taking someone else's holy sites and even you know the temple mount itself when king david came to jerusalem he did not take it by force he bought it from the owner and uh, but he could take it because he conquered all jerusalem but the holy place you don't take by force that's what the our our uh, fathers teach us and that's the heritage of the jews and it was never um, an ask or any demand by the jews to pray over the temple mount it is an important site for us but we never demanded to to pray on it and right now in the name of this demand we are ready to destroy all what we built here you're touching a very interesting point because the the, the vast majority maybe all the Haredi uh, Orthodox uh, Jews and leaders of this uh, jury are stating loud and clear that it is forbidden for a Jew to pray right now on Temple Mount before Messiah is coming. But in the last uh, maybe 10 or 15 years, other rabbis from the, from the uh, National Zionist movement more and more rabbis are saying that it is a mitzvah, it is something every Jew has to say. It is uh, familiar, especially uh, within the, the right wing and the extreme right. And what we see maybe, and I want to, to hear you about it, that these uh, extremists are taking us uh, this conflict from a national conflict to a, to a religious conflict. And this is very, very dangerous. Absolutely. And this is why I said that we are allowing the pyromaniacs to play with matches uh, at the volcanic core of our conflict, which is the Temple Mount uh, Haram Sharif. And uh, what they are uh, interested in is to change the place and to uh, undermine the Muslim presence and to make it a, a Jewish place. And for them, the Jewish prayer is just uh, one step in the way to eventually abolish uh, the, the mosques, uh, God forbid. But you know, uh, to, to, uh, to seal this uh, issue, you have extremists on the other side as well, and you, you find uh, over and over again hundreds of youngsters, of Muslim youngster, youngsters, uh, a, a gathering in the mosque with the stones and then Molotov bottles, etc., et and and throwing it on the Jews that are praying downstairs in the Western world. It's it's not a one-sided uh, uh, battle here. The other side, which is being fueled by Hamas, is trying to provoke and to to enlighten the whole arena as well. So this is why we're, we need to restrain our extremists to not to let Hamas and others to inflate the, the, the Temple Mount. And by the way, um, last month on, during Ramadan, the, there was a statement as if there were stones thrown from the Temple Mount on the Wailing Wall, and it was just not true. There was not a single stone thrown at the Temple Mount. There were stones thrown at the uh, police on the Temple Mount. But, you know, um, in the issue of the Temple Mount, uh, you don't need even something to be true to inflate the area. It could be a rumor, baseless rumor, to, to make a, a war here. So it's so sensitive and we are being so unwise because of right-wing extremists that managed to, you know, take over Likud party and um, to make members of Knesset uh, totally secular, who don't care about religion in general, to 
to say that it's so important that Jews will pray on the Temple Mount. It's a national issue, it's not a, a religious issue, but they're using the religious uh, sentiments in order to really um, make our conflict much, much harder to solve and much, much harder to live. Okay, my last question is, uh, again, more general. How does Peace Now regard the current government, which includes both the left wing and the settlers? Overall, it is a positive de development or a government that simply perpetuates the, the occupation. How significant is the participation of an Arab party in this government for the first time in the Israeli history? In terms of the policies in the West Bank, the settlements, there is no um, real difference between this government and previous governments. You can see it not only in the, the numbers that are more or less similar in terms of approval of plans and promotion of, of uh, settlements, but also in uh, major plans in projects that are very serious, that might undermine the possibility of a Palestinian state, etc., cetera, um, uh, developments in Hebron, developments in outposts, um, settler violence, all this is uh, almost uh, similar to, to previous uh, governments. So in our field of, of the occupied territories of the settlement policies, there is no difference. Maybe uh, the only difference is that there is a new administration in the White House that uh, to some extent is uh, managing to restrain uh, some very, very crazy plans. But in general, uh, this government is not uh, a and, and you don't government. Have the, you don't have this political issue of uh, saying to, the, to yourselves, listen, hey, this is not ideal, but the, the alternative is worse. Uh, Netanyahu can come back, and now it's a different Netanyahu. He's uh, without any restraints, and uh, he, can be do, he can be a lot worse to our uh, ideas. You don't, you don't think like, the, the, like this way? So I, I was talking about our issue. Of course, Netanyahu was uh, you know, doing many horrible things to, to the state of Israel, including destroying the democratic... Uh, system and, uh, and and that is not the case in, in this government. But in terms of occupation, this government is very, very bad. And I, I think that when we are opposing this policy, it doesn't mean necessarily to call for, you know, um, uh, falling, uh, to, call, to call the government to, to fall. Uh, if those who are uh, in favor of two states that don't like Israeli occupation in the government should have raised their voices and, and say something about this policy. And this doesn't mean that it will uh, immediately make the government fall, but start to argue, start to say something. You cannot just sit there and do nothing and say, oh, it will uh, make the government fall. It doesn't make the government fall. You just need to, to start to demand things and, and then we'll see what happens. Chagit Ofran, um, uh, the co-director of the Settlement Watch project of the Israeli Peace Now movement, Shalom Achshav. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Toda Rabah Chagit. And we will Thank uh, you very much, ben. go now for a, a, a short break and come back uh, just a, after it. Thank you. Toda Chagit. Bye-bye. Hello, I'm uh, Gilles Kepel, professor at uh, Sciences Po and the Normal Soup in Paris and author of a number of uh, books and articles on the Middle East. Through my new podcast, Reading the Middle East, on the award-winning media service and monitor, we will take a deep dive into the trends in the region with the authors and thought leaders who are shaping how we think about the Middle East. Reading the Middle East will be a fantastic addition to Al Monitor's outstanding podcast lineup, including On the Middle East with Andrew Paraziliti and Amber Inzaman, and On Israel with Ben Kaspit. You can subscribe on your favorite listening platforms. We look forward to your joining our conversation.
Foray staying with us. In this uh, uh, interesting conversation, Hagit Ofran from Peace Now, I, I asked her how come this uh, peaceful movement that symbolizes uh, peace and pragmatism is, is uh, acting as it was a, a part of the other side and, and renting a bulldozer, a D9, in order to uh, actually ruin or uh, vandalize this uh, illegal outpost named Chomesh. And she said that uh, they thought it's, it's, it's wise and maybe, maybe necessary to change the language. Uh, if the settlers are holding the whole state as a hostage, uh, we wanted, she said, to say it is insane. And if it's possible to rebuild Chomesh against the law, so it should be possible to ruin it. Simple logic, I think. In her view, it's, uh, it's impossible that uh, Israel will, will go on be, uh, be held hostage uh, by the weakness of the government and the law and the army and the police. And it's about time that the government and the, the army uh, will stop protecting these outlaws, the settlers, that are rebuilding this illegal outpost over and over again during the, re the years. By the way, uh, even the Netanyahu government, uh, since the disengagement, evacuated Chomesh uh, again and again, and all uh, every, each time the settlers came back and beat the yeshiva until this uh, terrorist attack uh, a year ago that uh, made Chomesh a symbol. Then we discussed uh, the core issue, and I think I asked uh, Hagit Ofran if the settlers won uh, eventually in the, when, when Israel and the Palestinians signed the Oslo Accords, it was 1993, and there were 40,000 uh, settlers in uh, Judea and Somalia or the West Bank. Now they, there is between half a million and 600,000, and uh, it looks like a clear win for the settlers' movement. And she said that, of course, uh, they won in the short term. Uh, they are there, they are growing uh, stronger, and uh, I think it's almost a consensus that no one sees a way that will enable Israel to, 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 uh, to just get out of the territories and evacuate so many settlements and settlers. We're talking about the nine million uh, people a state, and uh, but uh, she said that the, the settlers did not succeed convincing the Israeli people that they are really necessary. Uh, the public is not really interested in the settlements, and when a leadership, the right leadership, from her point of view, will will rise and decide that it's about time to go back to the two-state two solution. The public, the Israeli public, will still support it vast, in a vast majority. We mentioned also the so sensitive uh, holy place of the Temple Mount. And she said that this is the volcanic core of the conflict. And the Israeli government and the, and the police are uh, letting and allowing the pure maniacs, as uh, she called them, to play with matches right beside this, uh, this uh, fuel uh, reservoir that can lit the whole Middle East uh, in flames. But uh, finally, I have to, uh, to state that uh, after this uh, conversation, this podcast was recorded, I think the, the bottom line was that this year, the Jerusalem Day celebrations, the Parade of, parade of Flags uh, were held without eruption, without rockets from Gaza, without a third intifada, thank God. And uh, I hope to see you here next week, next time, next, ne ne uh, same, I'm sorry, same time, same place next week in a monitor in On Israel. I'm Ben Kaspi from Tel Aviv. Thank you. Take care and bye-bye.